So today, um, it's about a 40-minute presentation and then plenty of time for Q&A. And the main idea for today is what can EFS do to be useful here during this period of time, during this particular moment. Um, in my experience, education for sustainability and all the principles and practices that we uh, create conditions for folks to learn over time um, are always useful, particularly useful if you wanna grow and unleash your potential and also extremely useful during times like this when we need to weather the storm. So either way, very, very useful, but um, I think it's always difficult to draw on good thinking in a fear state. So it's, um, and in a kind of uh, difficult situation like this. So even more important to take a deep breath and think deeply and well uh, to, to ride the storm. So I'm going to share my screen. Oh, before I share my screen, actually, I'm gonna just do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so we do have a chat room. Um, we, let's see, we do have a chat room. And if you have any questions, just feel free to jot them down in the chat room. Or at 1.30, Atia has to get off for a little bit. So if you wanna ask a clarifying question or you need me to slow down, just take yourself off mute and ask away. Uh, feel free where it's an interactive session. It doesn't have to be uh, very formal. Um, and then uh, about 40 minutes in, I'll stop and open it up for Q&A. And again, you can just ask the question verbally, um, take yourself off mute, or you can put it in the chat box. Probably everyone is an expert at this point at uh, Zoom calls. So um, uh, if there are any other questions about logistics of using the system, uh, just pop it in the chat box and Atia can answer it for you in the meantime. So now I'm going to share my screen um, and off we go. Okay, so um, this is the statement that we always use to start the conversation because we want people to think about the world their relationship to it and their ability to influence it in an entirely new way. That is the goal of educating for sustainability. Um, there's, it's always good to have a one-liner. Uh, what do we actually mean by sustainability? And the quickest answer I've come up with so far is it's the capability to thrive over time. Again, quite useful every day. Uh, so that we can unleash our potential and be the best we can be and particularly useful uh, during times of uncertainty. Uh, most of what I'm going to draw on today comes from our uh, benchmarks, the Education for Sustainability Benchmarks document, which you can find on our website at cloudinstitute.org. Um, we were one of 42 authors of this document some years ago. Um, the, the U.S. Green Building Council got into the um, got interested in helping us measure the impact of education for sustainability, and we realized we needed a consensus document in the U.S. so that we were when we talk about it, we were all talking about the same thing. So this is the most recent consensus document we have that defines the field um, by the field, which we're very proud of. Um, you probably all know if you've worked with us before that we love Einstein's quote, the significant problems we face can't be solved with the same thinking we use to create them. So education for sustainability is our nod to, to Einstein and represents the different way of thinking that we think um, can help us get to the future we want. Um, I'm going to draw on some of the enduring understandings and the principles that we talk about all the time, but today I'm going to talk about them in the context of um, our current reality uh, and our way forward. So you've heard probably if you have a TV or a radio, uh, this saying we're all in this together. Well, it's always been true and always will be true. So I just want to remind us that interdependence is not only when there's a contagious virus on the loose, but it's also true um, every day. We're interdependent on one another and on the living systems upon which all life depends. And every day we need to operate uh, remembering that. 
And that's something I think every time I hear it on TV, I think, hmm, I hope it doesn't get overused and I hope, um, uh, and, and associated always with a crisis because um, it's actually quite an elegant context to be operating in. Um, this is one of the enduring understandings that you'll see in the benchmarks. Nature sustains life by creating and nurturing communities. Um, I think Again, being in community is probably the thing that has saved us, uh, both our educational community, and as you can see, I'm up at our farm up in the Hudson Valley, but having community, being able to operate in community on a daily basis um, is always wonderful, but particularly at a time like this, to be able to quickly access a network of people who you can call on, who you can offer help to. If we didn't have that going into something like this, it would be extremely, extremely difficult. So um, it's, we, uh, uh, we have a small farm here and as soon as um, this situation became evident, uh, everybody got online. We were talking about safety protocols, talking about how to get through this. So many people lost their restaurant business. Um, and we quickly rallied to say, what can we do? And so many creative ideas came out of this moment. Um, and uh, the, the thing to remember for us is that for people who are really in trouble, who are losing people or who are sick themselves, um, losing um, jobs, that's a quite different situation than those of us who are at home with a little bit of flexibility and the ability to think and be creative. So both, everybody's gonna be in a situation um, at some time or another and nice to have a variety of different folks in every community so we can be there for each other. Uh, I just pulled this because um, one of the teachers that I work with sent this to me. Um, this is a student in the Bronx and he's just in Brooklyn, sorry. And he, um, he was not at all worried as soon as schools closed down and he had to study from home. He knew he had community. He knew everybody had his back and he just switched gears and went on about his business. So you'll all get a chance to, you'll have a copy of this so you can read his whole, um, his whole quote. But I just thought this was a great example of um, the comfort we can all feel um, if we have community. And if, you're, if you don't have as strong a community as you want, and you're realizing that now, um, there's never, uh, it's never too late to build it. And again, very, very wonderful um, on a good day and essential in days like this. Um, this is something, it's a systems thinking uh, attribute. A small shift in one thing can produce big changes in everything. I think we now know that in a different way. It's always true again, but we've seen this um, happen globally from a very small event in a, in a town in China to a global pandemic um, in a very short amount of time. Having said that, the reverse is also true. And uh, it's quite amazing to me that uh, in a short amount of time, the entire world came together uh, with the same protocols to fight the same fight and to, uh, to reach the same goal. And if we can do that in this short amount of time, organize the entire world, um, we can do other things uh, and be proactive about the future we want and switch over to renewable energy and eliminate waste and do all the things we've wanted to do and thought maybe it would take decades to get to. Um, uh, but in fact, obviously, we can do what we need to do as quickly as we need to do it, and we've proven that. So I think that's something to hold on to. Um, clearly, adaptability helps all living things, including us, uh, survive and even thrive over time. And again, we say these things all the time in Education for Sustainability, but sometimes it's hard to wrap your mind around what it really means until you need it. Um, and so I just, I, I throw it out there. We quickly, um, we had a few events planned. I was going to be in Australia this season and New Mexico and Washington DC. And very quickly we switched gears and they just had an entire sustainability education summit in Australia online. 
and they quickly adapted and responded and we didn't miss a beat and it wasn't exactly the same of course we know that but um but it happened and we didn't lose any momentum and i think it's really important to practice adaptability when when it's easy to do so that when it's much more challenging you have the habit of mind and you can switch and turn problems into opportunities to create value um, and of course this is the next uh, this is g6 inventing and affecting the future it's one of our performance indicators um, demonstrating that habit of turning problems into opportunities to create value is actually a permaculture principle as well. It's a principle of nature. It's how nature thrives. Uh, Dorna Schroeder is on the, the Zoom call and she is one of the leaders in biomimicry education. And there are so many more um, ways of mimicking the way nature solves problems to solve human problems. Um, and this is one of them. Um, so what kind of future do we want? This is the question we always ask. And we're in a moment now, again, depending on your situation, if you're, if you're not in a crisis, um, if you're in a crisis, we're here for you. And if you're not in a crisis, it's a time to dream and a time to think about how we want to move forward differently. We can't go back. You can never go back. Um, but we can spiral forward um, and use this as an opportunity to do things differently. Um, so we, uh, one of our standards is cultural preservation and transformation. And one of the key questions is always, what do we want to preserve and what do we want to change? We're usually pretty good at changing what should have been preserved and preserving what should have been changed. But we have an opportunity today uh, and tomorrow to be thoughtful about um, making some of the shifts that we now uh, have the capacity to make. And of course, what does education have to do with it uh, is always our question. Um, uh, we have all the children and, and young people legally required to be with us uh, pre-K to 12, and then um, they'll go on to colleges and universities or they'll go on to careers, uh, hopefully. And so, um, Lifelong learning is key. It always was, and particularly now, um, will be key. This is going to be the century for learning, not necessarily just for knowing. Um, sustainability requires individual and social learning and community practice. This is very difficult for us to not be together during something like this, physically together. But again, we, we can do the best we can online and um, six feet apart when we see each other. But this is something we will do together, um, one way or the other. Um, and this is a good example. This is the U theory or theory U by Otto Scharmer. And he describes how organizations learn and change over time. Uh, and for those of you who are educators, you'll see that this follows the very same path that the individual learner uh, takes. Um, and so it's quite fascinating to see um, how organizations and individuals learn in the same way. So it begins, of course, with what we already know. We come into any situation knowing something. We learn something new. And then we reappraise, we reframe uh, what Piaget would call accommodation. Uh, if you learn something that, that fits into your existing schema, that we call that assimilation. But if you need to shift your frame in order to accommodate that new information, that's what the brain scientists call reappraisal or reframing. And then you have a moment of reckoning where you have a choice. And the brain scientists call that impasse where you have to either say, no, I don't want to reframe to accommodate this new information, or yes, I do. And as if you move through impasse, you get to insight, where all the uh, aha moments are and all the creativity. Um, and we want to teach kids and young people how to do that on a regular basis. And some things will fit in, and some things require shifting in order to understand them and to take advantage of them. And that's exactly what we're all going through at various uh, degrees of quality. Then once you've got that aha moment and you're ready to, to think differently, we want to apply it immediately because those old neural pathways will 
come back if we don't practice, practice, practice the new way of thinking. Uh, that's how it's going to stick. You can't unlearn something. You can only relearn. You can't unwire the brain, but you can rewire. But you need an alternative. You need somewhere else, a different way of thinking to move toward. And as, while you're practicing, 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 you keep an eye on the feedback, you reflect on it, you revise, and you continually improve your practice. And so that's probably what everybody's been feeling a lot recently. And um, so hopefully this is useful. This is sort of the lifelong learning curve, again, for, for us as individuals, but also for our families, for our communities, for our schools, for our organizations. Um, um, Learning is the thing that we need to reward each other for. Um, no one can know uh, in a time like this. We can only focus on what we can learn and how we can navigate and reconcile what we've known before with what is about to happen. Um, uh, that's, uh, there's no, no precedent for this and it's quite amazing. Another thing we talk about all the time is the commons, the places and things we share that we're all responsible for, that we all depend on and hold in trust for future generations. Um, guess what? Public health is a commons. We all depend on it. We're all responsible for it. Again, it couldn't be a better example of what it means to try to reconcile our individual rights with our collective responsibilities when they come into conflict with one another. Um, there are so many people uh, working on essential questions right now across the country. Um, you know, people protesting that their individual rights are being overridden by the common um, well being, by the um, collective responsibilities, and other people um, fighting for exactly the opposite that sometimes our collective responsibilities have to override our individual rights. And that is what it is to live in interdependence. And um, we would say that in a case like this, um, uh, the individual right has to be overridden by the wealth, the, the health of the public, because we're all individuals, we're part of the public. So we're nested systems, individuals are nested inside the public. And so there's no separation between the individual and the group. Um, and this is a great, um, a great ethical dilemma to navigate with students and with ourselves. This one we talk about a lot, and normally we talk about diversity makes life possible in the context of cultural diversity and biodiversity and gender diversity and discipline diversity, that diversity makes life possible. It, is, it, it assures resilience in, in the system. The reason I inserted it into this uh, presentation today is because what I've noticed is that certain socioeconomic conditions have given a whole range of people of diverse cultures similar health issues. So they've, it's become a kind of monoculture in terms of their health issues. And that has made them vulnerable to the coronavirus because they have heart issues or um, uh, respiratory issues. And that has given them a similar vulnerability, a common vulnerability um, that we don't want to see. And so common, having um, commonality across diversities of cultures, yes, of course, there's more diversity within any one culture than there is across cultures. But we want diversity to be our strength. Um, and we, want, we don't want um, common vulnerabilities to, to undermine our strength. So that's why I included this one here today. And of course, many of you have seen this one. I'm sure glad the hole isn't in our end. Um, you know, I've seen people tweeting from their yachts. I've seen people in emergency rooms um, and everywhere in between and people yelling at 7 p.m. in New York City to thank all the essential workers. Um, we're very lucky. My family is healthy. Um, everybody, we're still employed. Um, education and food production are both considered essential, which is really an interesting place to be in um, because in our society, uh, small farms and school systems don't seem to be um, 
considered essential, uh, you know, on a daily basis. So it's pretty interesting to for the for our society to realize that we are, and I think we can all reflect on that a little bit. Um, again, if you are losing people and you are sick yourself, you're down at the bottom of this picture. You're bailing. You're just trying to stay alive. So if you're at the top of the boat, in addition to the fact that you can't cut that boat in half because you don't get two boats, there's no separation between the two. Um, if we're at the top, it's an opportunity to see what else can we do? How can we be useful here to the folks that really need help? Um, so uh, rather than to just be hiding out and safe, is there something that, that each and every one of us can do? We've, we are going down to the farmer's markets every weekend because um, farmer's markets are considered essential in New York City. Uh, so that's one of the ways that we're contributing in addition to just doing things like this. Um, but um, we turns out we adopted an ER room in a hospital in the city because one of our regular customers down there couldn't pick up her cheese because she was working in the emergency room. So that was something we could do something about. So we did it. So I think any of us who are in a position to, some people are making masks. Um, uh, there's just so many ways that we can help each other, uh, even though, especially if we're safe and we're okay at the moment. Um, be good at calculating and minimizing the risks we are taking. Of course, that's true right at the moment um, in terms of going out to shop and going out for a walk. Um, again, this is another performance indicator that we want kids to develop this capability every day. It's particularly useful again during times like this, but also useful every day. This is a chart that many of you have seen it is the GDP, the global um, uh, gross domestic product, which is the green line going up, been steadily growing since 1945, the total amount of economic activity. And then we put it up against that purple line, which is the genuine progress indicator, which includes many of the indicators of quality of life that the GDP does not include, um, public health being one of them, um, and family stability and uh, quality education, um, so many of the attributes and indicators of quality of life. And as you can see, there's an inverse correlation between the, ec the total amount of economic activity and its effect on our quality of life. We could have started to see this line diverge in the 70s. And looking back at it now, it's easy to see, but developing that habit of mind of minimizing risks mean keeping, means keeping our eyes on the data and the indicators of well-being. And so going forward, I think I invite everyone to look at the range of quality of life indicators that we can keep our eyes on and be, a, be in a position to do something about them if they begin to go uh, in the wrong direction. Um, this is the GDP across about 15 different countries. Again, since about 1945, 1950, economic activity, activity steadily rising um, in all of these countries. And here are the quality of life indicators. Here's the genuine progress indicator in each of those same countries. Um, this has been going on quite a long time. The momentum was increasing, increasing, increasing. We've been watching it. People were thinking, what, where's the balancing loop? Where can we intervene in the system? Where's the leverage? Um, and suddenly we're on pause and um, we have a moment here to see if we can get these two lines to go together. Um, here is just the United States. There's, um, uh, I just pulled this one slide out. I have many other ones. And if you're interested in the reference for this, it comes from Robert Costanza's work in ecological economics. Um, and I can give you the reference of the paper or send you the paper if you like, just pop it in the chat box. And we do have a Google doc that we're building. So anybody that has resources to share um, or would like to look and see what others are sharing, um, Atia has put that in the chat box. Um, these are several different quality of life indicators. The GDP and the GPI are the blue and red but we also have the ecological footprint, which is the amount that we're demanding on biocapacity, country by country and in the world. 
then the amount of biocapacity itself country by country, which is the purple line. The blue is the life satisfaction indicator. Orange is the human development indicator. And you can see that they, the GDP can keep going while all those other indicators um, are going wacky. And we have a chance now to, to, again, aim our economic activity in such a way that it contributes to the well-being of all of these indicators. Um, and we have a chance now because the economic activity has slowed down dramatically almost to a halt. We can reboot and direct it, um, it uh, intentionally uh, toward things that contribute to our quality of life, like renewable energy, like uh, materials that can be cycled forever, um, uh, all kinds of things that, um, that I think we all know about, but now finally have a real opportunity to make happen in a short amount of time. Um, this again is a, a model that we use a lot to describe the nested systems. Uh, that we talk about a lot in sustainability. We put the economy in the center, not because it's the most important, but because it's the system most dependent on the other systems. Um, the economy, consider that the financial capital is nested inside the human and social capital. The, our public health crisis has crippled our economy. It couldn't be a better opportunity to understand what this is actually telling us. Um, again, we've been showing this model for years, and I think people sort of nod and say, oh, yes, that, that makes sense. But now we can see what happens when public health is in crisis. Um, it, it has a direct effect on the economy. Um, and then both the economic and social capital and human capital are both inextricably linked and completely dependent on the natural capital upon which all life and all production depends. And of course, it's all powered by the sun at the end of the day anyway. Um, and so we might as well get our energy from directly from the source and from other sources of renewable energy. Um, this is another enduring understanding we use a lot. Um, live by the natural laws. And that means the physical laws and ecological principles derived from nature. Um, they're non-negotiable. And there are a few of them that uh, Dorna and I actually put together a wonderful little protocol. We looked at 15 different pieces of literature um, where all the scientists said there are three principles of, of life on the planet or there's seven principles or six principles. So we will put that uh, protocol in the chat box as well uh, because they are non-negotiable and the sooner we all start living um, by knowing those principles and living with what we call the operating instructions for Spaceship Earth, the better. This is one of them. Life organizes towards life. Um, life contributes to its own regenerative capacity, which means in layperson's terms, something always makes it on this planet. Uh, life prevails so far. Um, and it's also really important to remember that 0.1% of the species that have ever lived on Earth are still here, have prevailed. Um, we have what it takes to thrive over time and to build that capability to thrive over time. We have thumbs, we have consciousness, we have jazz, we have so many things going for us. Um, we just need to put our minds to it and make sure that we are among the 0.1% that thrives over time during this next period. We have an opportunity here. And towards the end, I'm going to show you some photographs that Atia has been collecting about um, how quickly the earth is healing during this period. And whatever we do going forward, I want us to, to, to make sure that that continues. And um, that's, that's one way that we can thrive over time. Here's another one, to assume it's possible. Already I hear people saying, oh no, people will just go back to normal, whatever that is. And no, I don't really think anything's gonna change when we get out of this. People just wanna get back to their lives. Well, okay, we call that the bummer mental model. Um, the kids call that person the given ups, uh, those people the given ups. Um, let's not be given ups. Let's assume we can pull off moving forward in a radically different way than we were headed before. Um, we, we like to say if you're headed towards a cliff, slowing down isn't going to solve your problem. You are going to need to turn. 
but slowing down has given us a chance to think differently so that we can make that turn. Um, so uh, I say let's assume it's possible and go for it. Uh, healthy si uh, systems have limits is another classic mental model of sustainability. Um, it is not a loss of autonomy, autonomy, it is not scarcity, it is simply using constraints to drive creativity. And these constraints that we're in right now, not being able to be, you know, hug our friends and, and anybody that's not in our household, um, not being able to go about our jobs, um, it is so hard and yet the kind of creativity I've seen coming out of this from the people that are in a position to be creative, again, not everybody's expected to be creative if we're in crisis. So for those of us who are in a position, it's up to us to, to take hold of that. Um, but again, couldn't be a better example of the beauty of driving, um, of using constraints to drive creativity. Um, I'm just amazed at what I've seen going on and the fact that we are all responsible for the difference we make. Again, we say this all the time, but I think it's particularly useful at the moment. Um, you know, if, you, if you're getting frustrated and you just want to take your mask off and, and go kiss somebody on the street, um, we have to remember, you know, maybe we don't have to worry, but we want to make sure that they don't have to worry either. And that is interdependence. That's what it is. And um, again, it's kind of abstract on a normal day, but it's pretty concrete right now. And I think that's a good one also to remember and, and keep by our side. Um, change is inevitable. It is another operating principle, uh, op operating instruction for Spaceship Earth. Um, and yet we are hardwired to think of change as a death threat. Um, our reptilian brains um, feel safer with what we know and feel very unsafe in times of insecurity and, and uncertainty. Uh, and I think what, we, what I invite all of us to do is to say, what can I count on? Um, I can be safe around what I can count on, but change, since it's inevitable, it's going to happen. And so, and we have an opportunity here to make some fundamental changes going forward that will actually ensure our security and more and more certainty in our lives. Um, and so we need to override our brain's fear of change and, and um, apply some mindfulness to that. And mindfulness is the way to convince the brain that actually change is where our security will come from. Um, so that's an invitation to all of you. Uh, appropriate disturbances create the new cycles of life. That's another one of our core principles. Um, uh, this is true, again, for volcanoes, for hurricanes, um, for um, particularly for natural disasters, earthquakes and things like that. The science teachers will tell you that um, we, we have been teaching about them as natural disasters, um, things that we should fear. But in fact, without them, without those plate tectonics moving as they do, there would be no life on planet Earth. So that's a kind of humbling thought. Um, so it's only a disaster if you happen to live in a place uh, or too close to a place that's going through that kind of appropriate disturbance. Um, this is Hawaii after one of the volcano eruptions. Um, and this is when the, the um, lava had cooled down a little bit, so it started to harden. If this is your car, it doesn't seem like an appropriate disturbance to you. We, everybody needs to understand that. Depends on where you're standing in the system. That word appropriate, um, I was in an editorial committee meeting the other day and everybody said, what do you mean this is not an appropriate disturbance, this virus? Well, if it, if it contributes to the next cycle of life in a better way, then, then from life's point of view, it may be appropriate. Again, if that's your car or if you are sick or you've lost someone, uh, as a result of this, it doesn't seem appropriate, um, but um, it is the way life works. Um, here's what happens next at this in this place in Hawaii, um, and then this, and then this. 
And that is an example of an appropriate disturbance in a disturbance creating the new cycle of life. Um, creativity, this is a quote by Fritjof Kopra. Um, he defines creativity as the generation of new forms, is a key property of all living systems and contributes to nature's inherent ability to sustain life. So we do need to muster it up as painful as it can be to be creative during times like this. It is what will sustain us and help us thrive over time. Um, again, the belief in our abilities to succeed is critical. Um, it's one of our performance indicators, again, in inventing and affecting the future. I drew a lot of the indicators from that standard, inventing and affecting the future, because it's all about perseverance and risk taking and uh, turning problems into opportunities. So that one came in handy. And here are the pictures that Atia has been collecting for all of us. On the left is um, uh, a picture of the Himalayas that you cannot see. And on the right, of course, for the first time in 20 or 30 years, um, they're able to see those Himalayas. So I just keep thinking whatever happens going forward, let's keep those Himalayas in sight. Here's another um, uh, photograph that, that Atia found for us. Um, this is the Northeast United States, quite extraordinary. Who would have thought that we could dramatically shift um, air pollution in this way in such a short amount of time. Let's keep it going in the same direction, but put our lives back together uh, in a healthier and, and more meaningful way. Here's China. Look at that. Some of you may have seen some of these, but I don't think you can ever get tired of looking at these pictures. Um, this is extraordinary. And lastly, Beijing, top and bottom. I just, I cannot stop looking at those pictures. I look at them several times a day, every day. Um, this is an extraordinary moment. We don't wanna go back to the top of that screen. And of course, I'm gonna end on Buckminster Fuller's quote, the best way to predict the future is to design it. So on the slideshow, you'll see that these are all the ways that we can help school systems. We always work in partnership. A lot of our partners are on the call. Um, and if you would like to get a hold of us, um, let us know, contact us at Cloud Institute. We're also collecting exemplars of anyone who is educating for sustainability, who has curriculum materials, assessments, student work samples, um, that address any of the benchmarks. We would love you to contribute that to the EFS Collective, fill out a little survey and contribute that. We have a set of reviewers um, uh, out there who will um, make sure that they do, that the material does meet the standards and the, um, the benchmarks. Um, but we wanna show people, for the early adopters, they'll just learn what education for sustainability is and they'll start doing it. For everybody else, we need exemplars and we don't have enough. So anybody who has exemplars and you know what you're doing and you're willing to share, please send it to us at the EFS Collective. And then that Google Doc I promised you, um, the link for that is here and also in the chat box. So look and see what other people have contributed and uh, contribute anything that you have that's useful. Um, as well. And I also know that the Green Schools National Network has put together a gorgeous collection of online resources for educators um, so that you all can keep going. Uh, anyone who's got students in your care, um, it's a wonderful set of resources that um, you can use to educate for sustainability online.